just kind of more of the same. You guys have heard it all uh, from people that are more learned than me. But we again, we got plenty of gas and plenty of shale gas. So you see that number, 862, uh, is what uh, well, at least the slide says we got the shale gas. I think we have more. Okay. Next slide. How do we get all this stuff? Well, you know, I'm not going to give you all lessons in, in petroleum engineering, although I could. But here's something that you don't hear that much talked about. And um, the problem, you know, and obviously, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about fracking. And uh, I'm getting some very interesting perspectives. I've been spending a lot of my time lately up in Washington and hearing a lot of really interesting things. And we know gas land, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. But there is also reasons for people to have legitimate fears. You know, that fear comes more from a lack of understanding. And I would just say this, if I could give Aubrey McClendon advice or Larry Nichols at Devon or anybody like that, I'd say, look, maybe the people are not correct in their, in their, in, in their, in their, maybe their fears are not based in what should be sound scientific reality. But the industry has done a very poor job of explaining why people shouldn't be afraid. And then you have issues like Macondo, which I mean, I know it's a deep water offshore, uh, you know, well blowout. But then you've got, you know, issues like Parker County, just west of Fort Worth, where, you know, it's alleged that range resources has, has contaminated some wells, and, and, you know, people turn their spigots on, and, you know, you can light them on fire. Well, you probably could do that before the, the fracking was even done, you know. But nevertheless, a lot of this fear is based in just ignorance. So I think it's incumbent on the industry to get rid of that ignorance, and, and, and they need to do that in a very cogent way, in a very coordinated way, where the producers, the service companies, the industry advocacy groups, and everybody kind of comes together with a clear message, okay? And, and, and a lot of those problems or a lot of this misunderstanding can be cleared up. And if you, then you may actually win people over that, look, gas can be the solution to our future. Natural gas, I should say, and it can be the solution to, to, to improving your own personal financial situation. And that's when you're going to get people people's attention. And I think the industry can do a much better job um, at that task than, than, than they've done. Uh, the old Dick Cheney way, just trust us, and you know it's our way or the highway. That's not going to work anymore. Okay. So this 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 is really interesting. Like one of the one of the technologies, for example, I'll just get into one. You can literally put in benign isotopes that occur naturally, you know, they're, they're, they're natural things in nature. Put them in the, the drilling mud, put them in the frac fluid. If you, if you, when you're drilling a well, if those same isotopes end up in a uh, uh, producing horizon, in an aquifer, okay, or when you frack the well, if those same isotopes end up in a contaminated well and those isotopes are there, that's like a DNA footprint. Aha, there you go, this must have been a, a bad frack job. Or, or, or when you when you drill the well, you have a bad <coughs> cement job, yeah. and you, you got some leakage through the through the well bore, whatever. But if there is some methane detected in in the aquifer, and that isotope is not there, then you, as a producer, are essentially completely exonerated. You know, it may have been some other producer at some other time. You know, it may be naturally occurring methane. But if that isotope is not there, then you're basically exonerated from all these accusations. And this technology is there; it's available. It's not even proprietary. It's, it's not that big a deal. The industry doesn't want to spend the money or they don't want to subject themselves to, you know, the requirement to have to do this. And I think it's, it's folly on the part of the industry to take that approach. Nevertheless, so we'll leave that slide and uh, move, move on. Actually, somebody said earlier, I think Tom said <laughs> something about, about Aubrey McClendon having said about the, the, well, the fracking fluids are fine. It's the same stuff that's under your, under your kitchen sink. And who would want to drink what's under your kitchen sink? It's like, mm. You know, that, that's not exactly uh, building confidence here. Okay. Uh, all right. This, this is just kind of a chart that just shows you basically on a relative basis how clean the natural gas is to other fuel alternatives. Jordan, next time we do this, we should also have gasoline and diesel because that's what we're really trying to displace uh, versus oil and coal. But obviously, you could use an oil column as kind of a proxy for refined products. Okay, but uh, clearly you can see in, in, in every metric, natural gas is cleaner. And it's real simple. If any of y'all had college chemistry, and it's like one carbon, four hydrogens. If, if, I couldn't tell you as much, you know, uh, chemistry and, and um, um, uh, organic chemistry and all this stuff. I couldn't tell you what the uh, chemical formula for gasoline or diesel is, but I know it's got a bunch of benzene rings and a bunch of nasty stuff, you know, and that's why I like uh, methane better because it's so simple. So... Um, now this is significant. Uh, let's see, I'm actually losing on the bottom of the page. 
Uh, yeah, no, it's down here. Um, when Jordan and I were in, uh, in uh, Salt Lake City, what, about six weeks ago, um, we, we went to a grand opening of a LNG CNG station. They sell LNG and CNG at the same station. The LNG was a dollar eighty nine per gallon equivalent, and the CNG was a dollar twenty nine. And I have these wonderful photographs. They're stuck on my iPhone, I, and which I'm having a problem. I meant to have them in the presentation. And you see this dollar eighty nine and dollar twenty nine per gallon equivalent in, in neon lights because I went by at night. You know, it's very dramatic. And and then you see the you know the three something in the background for the gasoline and the almost four bucks for the diesel. And it really gets the point of, uh, across. The state of Utah is light years away, or light years ahead of the rest of the country, although Oklahoma's making a quick run to catch up with them. But Utah, and specifically Questar, the, the LDC pipeline, they're, they're kind of, in, they do a little bit of everything. You know, they're the LDC out there, they're an EMP company, and they're a regional pipeline company. And they're doing all kinds of innovative people and working with the community to make use of that resource. And of course, they're doing it in their self interest because, you know, there's Rocky's gas. If they don't burn it up, you know, the price, in, it, 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 you know, at, at, at uh, Opal is going to go down like this, so they might as well burn it up, and that way they can get the price at Opal up, you know, a little bit. So, uh, but they're, they're really doing some neat stuff, and I would encourage you all to go out there and, and see what they're doing. Uh, or if you wait around long enough, we'll, we'll bring it here because that's what we're working on. Okay, uh, next slide. Let's see. All right, so this is, this is a little bit technical mumbo jumbo, but the main thing I want you to get, with respect to 18 wheelers, there's two types of uh, combustion technologies um, to, to utilize uh, uh, LNG or even compressed natural gas um, you know, as, a, as a motor fuel. Um, your really big Class A trucks, the ones that are pulling uh, dual trailers that are going across the Rocky Mountains, they need a 15-liter engine to do that. And currently, the 15-liter engines that run on LNG also have to, also have, to have uh, uh, the assistance of a little bit of diesel. So they're really called dual fuel engines. Now, those engines do not have a spark plug. You don't normally think of a spark plug associated with a diesel engine. Diesel engines have a glow plug. All that is is just a little heater to kind of pre-warm the cylinder to make it easier to start. But once it's running, these 15-liter engines they, they burn 5% five, 5 diesel fuel and 95% LNG. And essentially, the diesel fuel is what you need to kind of initiate the combustion, okay, for, for those engines because the compression ratio on those engines is 15 to 1, which is pretty standard like any other diesel engine. So one of those 15-liter 15, those 15 engines with a 15 to 1 or 16 to 1 compression ratio can pull a tandem 18-wheel truck over the Rocky Mountains, no problem, just as good as a conventional diesel engine. Okay, but the fuel is obviously a lot cheaper. And what they do, they literally have a secondary fuel tank, and about every, every tenth tank full of LNG, they fill the little diesel tank up. So you don't have to do it every time. You just fill that up and then go on about your business. Now, the good news is that with all of the new 2012 environmental standards, those trucks don't need all these ammonia absorption units and all the stuff that's just given the, the truck operators fits with the new diesel technology. So there's all kinds of advantages aside from the fact that the fuel's half price, you know, to using, uh, you know, LNG as the primary fuel for 18-wheel engines. Now, the smaller trucks, and they're really not smaller trucks, but uh, like, for example, Cisco Foods, HEB grocery stores right here in Texas, they operate LNG trucks out of their food commissaries. Okay, those trucks, because they're not crossing the Rocky Mountains, they're not tandem trucks, so usually they're never pulling more than a 53-foot trailer, and usually those trailers... They, those trailers run out of bulk space before they reach their maximum weight. So they're, not, they're just not pulling as heavy a load as, as the 15-liter trucks. Uh, Cummins Westport, who makes these engines, they make a 9-liter truck that is a spark-assisted diesel engine. So the, the compression ratio on that one is only 9 to 1. But that one doesn't need the diesel at all. It runs on 100% natural gas LNG. But it has to have a spark plug to help it out. So it's, it's kind of an odd duck. Now, uh, we met a fellow with, uh, with uh, Packard, which is Kenworth, and um, um, what's the other truck brand? Anyway, they are working on a 12-liter. It's like everyone said, man, why don't you guys make a 12-liter? That's what we need. So they're working on that right now. Okay. So anyway, all right. Uh, next page. How big is this market 
Well, the first market I'm going to talk about is 18 mil trucks. That's what I call the low hanging fruit. That's what Boone Pickens is going after. Not that I'm copying him, but that's the obvious thing to do. You know, like if you're going to go to an orange grove, you don't pick one that's way at the top, you pick the one that's on the bottom. Okay. So there's 2.2 million heavy duty Class 8 tractor trailers in the United States. Jordan did a little study. The top 100 companies have 360,000 units. So we're going to go, we've got a little list of the top 100s. That we're going to go those guys first. They, these, are, these are common carriers. Uh, FedEx, Ground, uh, UPS, uh, YRC, which is uh, the Yellow Freight Roadway. They merged together. Two city companies came together. Ryder, you know, uh, Penske, so on and so on. So these are common carriers. Swift Trucking, J.B. Hunt, you could go on and on. You know, CCC, a Creek Carrier, you know, I used to know them all. 360,000, okay. So all we got to do is just, we don't have to chase them down. We just got this big directory. I'm like, hey, you want to save a bunch of money? And then you've got what I call private fleets. For example, Coca-Cola Enterprises, Cisco Foods, Walmart stores. Walmart stores has these 2 million square foot distribution centers. They have 141 of those. If you ever go buy one, there's one on uh, I-35 near New Brunfels. There's, at any given time, there's four or 500 tractor trailer trucks there, you know, the trailers, you know, just waiting to, to bring all that stuff from China to us, to a Walmart near you. So, in any event, um, you know, that's a big U.S. food service, uh, Pepsi, you know, uh, Anheuser-Busch, you know, the uh, Frito-Lay, I mean, you just go on and on. Uh, so, you take the top, the top 100 private, private fleets, okay, they've got 110,000 uh, Class A trucks. So, between the top 100 common carriers and the top 100 private fleets, that comprises about 25% uh, of this 2.2 million. And these trucks actually operate, I think on a per mile basis, more than the, the other, than the rest of them. Okay? Anyway, so this is a significant number. These trucks account for 10% of the domestic uh, oil consumption in the whole country. 10% of all of our consumption. Okay? And 50% of the domestic diesel. Okay? All right, so it's a big market, and it's just right there for the picking. 